today. God, thank you that you've been poured out because of what Jesus did on the cross. We're two or more gathered in your name. You're here in the middle of us. But Father, we are renewed and refreshed by your Holy Spirit when we stand in this place to worship. God, we don't take for granted the access we have to a holy God. But Father, because of simply what Jesus did for us. So Father, I pray that you would renew us, that you would refresh us today. But Father, no matter what has gone on the week behind us and what's ahead of us this week, the Father, you are for us, therefore who can be against us? The Father, we put you first and we stand in a place of leaning and trusting and relying upon you. So, Father, I pray this morning that we would have ears to hear. We have eyes to see all that you have. The Father, you would guide us and lead us and that we would walk in the footsteps you've created for us. Father, we love you today and we worship you today. And we give you all the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. Come on, give God some praise. That's awesome. Well, so good to see you uh, here today. Welcome those who are online today for baptism. And let's say hi to those guys. Welcome. Glad you're with us. And then if you could, turn around and say hi to somebody right around you. you take your seats. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mariah, and we're so glad you've joined us here today. Before we move on, we would like to take a second and get you up to speed on what's happening at City Point. Check this out. Community groups have been off to a great start so far. If you didn't know, that's what we call our small groups here at City Point, and we believe they're the best way to get connected and find friends who are on the same faith journey as you. We encourage you to check out all that we have available at citypointchurch.com groups. And you know what? I bet there's a perfect one out there just for you. If you still have questions, feel free to talk with one of our group leaders out in the live lobby. They'll make sure to point you in the right direction and get you excited about joining a group this semester. Connection Point is taking place Sunday, March 10th from 1.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. This is our membership class where we share the vision of our church, talk about healthy habits of a believer, and discuss how you can make a difference in the world you live in. Whether you are new to church or just simply new to City Point, this is the class for you. Head over to citypointchurch.com slash connection point and register you and your family today. Our next child dedication will take place on Sunday, March 24th during all of our services. This is a special weekend that symbolizes your pledge as a parent to raise your child in a Christian home and church where they can come to know, love, and serve Jesus. It also signifies our commitment to provide a loving biblical community that supports and prays for your family. If you would like to participate, please let us know by registering ahead of time at citypointchurch.com slash events. One more thing, we absolutely love meeting new families. In fact, if this is your first time with us, we hope that we've made you feel right at home. You can learn more about City Point by simply filling out the connection card in your seat back pocket and dropping it off in the offering bucket at the end of service. And don't worry, your information is safe with us and we're not gonna bother you. We just want to share how you can take your next steps with us when you're ready to do so. Also, make sure to step by our next steps area in our live lobby so our team can meet you and give you a gift on your way out. It's just simply our way of saying thanks for joining us. And that's what's going on at City Point. If you miss something or have any questions, feel free to chat with our team at the info desk or send us an email at info at citypointchurch.com. All right, y'all, grab your notes and welcome Pastor Eddie to the stage as he wraps up our series, You Are Known. smile. I feel like I should be like really like go, you know, anyway. Um, good to see you. Glad you're at church today. We've had a great day so far. And just a few, a little bit later, we're going to baptize today. And I do want to say for those who are here and maybe you're not prepared to be baptized, I want to let you know we're ready for you. And I haven't done this the other services, but this is our third service. So I want to let you know if, if you're just in your street clothes, you're like, man, I'd love to get baptized. I'm not ready. We have everything you need. We have a baptism shirt, life to the fullest. Uh, we also have 
shorts and underwear and deodorant for the ladies. We have that extra thing that you need. We got all that stuff. So if today during this service, you kind of get in your heart like, man, I forgot his baptism and I really want to get baptized. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. Tomorrow is not promised. So take advantage of today and, and, and a little bit later when I dismiss everybody to go get baptized, it'll be right around the offering time. Just get up with them and say, hey, I want to be baptized too. Because I think for some, it's a decision you don't need to wait on. It's a decision you just need to say yes, because if God instructs us to do it, we step out in it. So here we are in this series called We Are Known, and we've been looking at how God sees us. And, you know, we, we're known by other people. Um, we're, we're known by ourselves, or at least we think we know who we are. Uh, we, we often are more aware of our limits than we do are aware of our potential. And I think it's God's grace and His mercy that brings that potential out in our lives in our lives. And I'm amazed sometimes how we have a distorted self view. I know for a good bit of my life, I had to wrestle with voices that said I couldn't until I really learned to lean into God's voice that said I could. And I tell you that that God sees us so clearly. Man sees the outside of our life, but only God sees our true potential. I mean, we often see our struggles, but we don't see how God is working through the middle of those struggles, how God motivates us. And so we are known by God. And maybe we're only known by others, by our past, or by what we're doing now. But when God sees you, he not only sees who you are today, but he sees you out of time. And what I mean by that is he sees the future. That maybe there's something he's going to ask you to do in a month or two that you're going to step out and do, and it's going to change the rest of your life. Maybe you're single and you're like, I don't know if I'll ever get married. Maybe there's somebody that somehow God's going to cross your paths, and a year from now you'll be sitting here as a Mr. and Mrs. You never know what God knows about us. And that's why it's so key for us to lean into his wisdom and to lean into his leadership in our life. And so there's a story that I read that really is, is the foundation of this message. And I came across it in just my daily Bible reading. And I encourage y'all to do this. Is if you're at Call City Point Home, is to get into the Word of God on a daily basis. I don't care if it's a verse a day or, or you read the Bible through in a year. Our church app, you can read the Bible through in a year. There's version is another great one that has different plans and all that. But I encourage you to get into the Word of God every day because you never know what God's going to speak to you through His Word. And so in Mark 2 is the story I want us to turn to. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, uh, it's obviously going to be on our screen. But it says this. As he walked along, he saw this Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Now, we know him as Matthew, but, this is, but he's also Levi. He says, follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. And while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And while the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not only the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. And in the scripture, when I read it, it reminded me of just how special we are to God. Here is Jesus having a dinner with a table full of what they called sinners. But at that table, he had one of the great apostles that would be uh, in the formation of the 12 and in the New Testament. That simply by a relationship sitting around a table that he turned this man into a disciple. And this disciple was turned into an apostle. Jesus, when he saw Levi, did not see a tax collector. He saw the Apostle Matthew. He saw a man of God. He saw somebody who was capable of preaching and teaching and performing signs and wonders and miracles and picking up the mantle of the cross and carrying it to his generation. The world sees you for what you do. God sees us for who we really are. And there's something about plugging into who who he is and plugging into allowing his voice to supersede any other voice in our life that transforms us. When he looks at us, even though we may have, like he said, he said, I didn't come to to the well, I came to the sick. He is the doctor that cures us and heals us. And as I was reading this text, it just reminded me why our small groups are so important. That why we put energy into having small groups as a church. Because this is where we grow disciples. What is a disciple really at its true core? A disciple is somebody who applies the word of God in doing two things. Growing in loving God and growing in loving one another. In fact, Jesus said, if you could hang the entire scriptures and all the commandments on those four words, love God and love people. 
And to be a true follower of Christ, to be a disciple, is about applying those things in our life. It's about taking that and saying, God, I want to grow in those areas in our life. Discipleship is not merely knowledge because knowledge is not enough. In fact, James tells us that there's devils in hell who knows who the Son of God is and know who Jesus is. So it's not just knowledge, but it's when we apply that into our life that we're transformed. In fact, there's nations all over the world right now where Christians like you are worshiping God and they don't have the luxury of what we sit in. They don't have Bibles on their iPhones or iPads. They don't have multiple Bibles at home. Maybe they just have a, a passed down scripture or pieces of the Bible. But nevertheless, they are just as much a disciple as you and I because they are learning how to love God and to love people. There's something about a disciple's heart that just says, I want to be like Jesus. I just want to be, grow and become like him. First John 2 says this, but those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That's how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. And one of our goals as a church, it's among many things, is, is that through our small groups is that we help develop disciples. Yes, make some relationships. Yes, have a good time. But we want to help one another grow in loving God better and loving one another. And truly, discipleship cannot take place in a bubble. It requires other people to be a part of your life. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't signed up, take that next step. Sit at the table with others and allow God to develop you in who he's called you to be. But also what spoke to me was not only about the need of our small groups, but then this, is that Jesus saw Levi, and Jesus made a room for Levi. Jesus made a space at that table for him. And for some of you that have been a part of our small groups, I really believe in my heart, and I've been, this has been on my heart now for two or three weeks, I just can't get rid of it, is that it's your season to stand up and lead. Next semester, it's time for you to stand up among the others and say, hey, I want to lead. Whether you're in a men's group or a women's group or a co-ed group or a freedom group, there are people in this room that God has designed a table for you to sit at and to make disciples. And I pray that God grabs your heart. I pray even as this semester you're sitting in your small group, this idea, this thought that Jesus has designed a table for me, that there's a Levi waiting for me to step up and to make a table for them. I love the fact that Jesus said there's a doctor in the house. And for some of us, we need to take that promotion and allow God to use our life in that way. And maybe you've been a part of a church where you did something like that, or maybe even our own church, you did a small group and nobody showed up. I've told the story of how my very first small group as a church, there's a couple times where I showed up and it was just me. But guess what? We just keep doing it. So get back on that horse and ride it because the mission is too important. Because leadership is not about convenience. It's always about calling, making yourself uncomfortable to reach the next. It's kind of the story of our church. It's the legacy of who we've been the last 11 years. This is our fourth auditorium as a church. It's why we have three services is because there's a Levi that needs a table to sit at to grow in his relationship with God. That we make that decision, we, make, we decide to be a maker of disciples. That we allow God's people to find a seat at the table. In fact, it's the mantle that Jesus gave to us. The last words that he said, he said this. He said, there go, therefore, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Get them around tables, develop them baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is what we're just about to do. Teach them. Uh, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands. That's what we're doing now. We're teaching large, large group. But then he says this, I have given you, be sure of this, I am with you always and even to the end of the age. Even though we call it small groups, it's really just a continuation of what Jesus began. That Jesus developed his disciples in these groups and he told Peter and other disciples what I see in you beyond what they saw themselves. Peter saw fishermen. Jesus said, I saw a fisher of men. So I wanna pray, uh, pray for us and pray for you that as we move through this year that God speaks to many of your hearts because there's people waiting on the other side of your obedience and there's joy in watching the harvest come in. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word, for your truth. I thank you that Father, you've always seen more in us than what we see in ourselves. And Father, I pray that we would elevate our view of ourselves to what you see and not lower it, God, to what we see. We thank you that we're known by you. In Jesus' name, amen. There, there's five things that I want to share with you today about this story that really stuck out with me. And here Jesus is eating with these sinners, driving the Pharisees crazy. He saw potential. He saw disciples. All they saw were tax collectors and sinners. And as Jesus was sitting with Matthew, you see this process where, where Matthew is, is drawn in and grown. It's the same process he takes us on. So I want to walk you through that real quick. Levi didn't seek Jesus out. Jesus sought out Levi. 
If you read the story, Jesus came walking along him and said, come follow me. Let's, let's go eat dinner. Let's, 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 you know, let's see what's happening in your life. And it kind of reminds me of so many times in our life that we don't see the potential of who we really are. And it reminded me of, a, there's a show called Antique Roadshow. If you have time to waste on a Saturday, you could watch this show. And it kind of, if you've ever watched it, it makes you want to never throw anything away ever again, right? Because it may be worth something. <laughs> I doubt that for us, but it may be, right? And so I was watching it, and there was this young lady, she's about the young woman, she's about to go to college, and her grandmother passed away. And her grandmother had this framed picture that hung over her bed. Her grandfather was in a dude ranch in, in, in Texas somewhere, and, and this painting had been passed down to them. And so she was looking at this painting about to go to college. She's going to take it to college. It's just going to be something sweet to remember her grandmother by. And she noticed underneath the glass a mosquito had gotten in there. And so she thought, well, I don't want to ruin this print, so let me you know, open this up and take this mosquito out. But when she went to go remove that mosquito, she realized this is not a print. This is an actual painting. And so she went to find it to get it appraised. And when she went to find the appraisal, they were like, oh, yeah, 200, 250 tops. But then she was natural curiosity, started, started thinking, what is the name of this artist and, you know, what has he done? Well, she began to look up this artist and thought, maybe it's worth a little bit more than that. And so she went to the Antique Roadshow and brought her painting with her. And there was a, a special, someone who specialized in that art, and she began to look at it. She goes, no, this is not worth $200 or even $250. This is more like $300,000. And you just see this, this young lady begin to cry. And I, I think the conflict was, I know my grandmother gave it to me, but I could sell it and pay for college. That's what I think she was crying about. Um, but all of a sudden, what was considered almost invaluable, worthless, became appraised in the right hands at something so valuable. And I think many times in our life, we listen to the wrong appraisers about who we really are. Sometimes that faulty appraiser is the voice of your, your own head. We talked about it last week. But I think what happens if we put our lives in the one who values us, who appraises us, who says that you're worthy of everything that I have for you? What if we allow the one who makes a seat at a table for us to be the one who says you're worthy and you can be who God's called you to be? Though I find you as a sinner, though you are sick, I can make you whole, I can make you healthy. So I want to share five things with you about the way God sees us, that we're known, and I want to close this series up with this. And the very first thing I want to say is this, is that he sees us. He sees us. Now, what does that mean? In other words, he sees us for exactly who we are. There's a story in Genesis 16 where it talks about uh, Abraham and Sarah, and, and really before that, chapters before that, God called them to be the father and mother of a nation at the age of 75. And years had passed since God had given that, them, that promise. And so Abraham and Sarah, basically their fear plan was, we need to do something about this. We need to help God out. And we've all tried to help God out. So in their case... Uh, Sarah said, why don't you marry my maid, Hagar? So this became his second wife. Now, we see that in the Old Testament. The New Testament, God says, no, 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 you just need one wife. Because he looked around, he's like, this is not good. Like, 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 I'm so glad that God made a decision that men should only have one wife. Because I cannot imagine somebody sitting down in my office being like, I have a problem with my third wife. I'm like, good luck. Like, I don't know how, how you have a marriage with four people in it. So I'd be like, thank you, Jesus. I don't know what, what I, don't, I don't even know, but thank you that there's just one, right? So anyway, so Abraham and Sarah, had these, he had these two wives. And of course, Sarah got jealous of Hagar because she became pregnant. And because of that jealousy, she began to mistreat Hagar and drove her out into the wilderness. And so there she was, pregnant with this child of Abraham, alone in this wilderness, no food, no water, basically just content to die in that wilderness and the Lord showed up at her, at, to, to her side and began to speak to her. And he began to tell her what, what they don't see is, this is what I know about you, Hagar, is that from that child will become a great nation. And then he began to give her some very practical advice how to go back to the home of Abraham and Sarah. And I will take care of you. I will provide for you. This son will grow up and be something great. And in the middle of that wilderness where nobody else saw her, where nobody else cared for her, where nobody else missed her, she said this, Verse 13 of Genesis 16, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. I've now seen the one who sees me. In the middle of her pain, in the middle of her wilderness, in the middle of, of a difficult relationship, in the middle of a place where nobody else seemed to care, she was seen by God. And not only seen by God, but God told her, this is the plan I have for your life. Church, he sees you. 
And I pray that this story captures your heart. For some of you right now, that you're looking at all the reasons why life won't work, there's a God who loves you and sees you. And if you lend your ear to his voice, he will tell you, this is what I have for you. These are the plans and these are the purpose that I have for you. That brings me to the second point. Since he sees us, he also has chosen us. He chose us. Because he has chosen us, it makes God's plan that it was no accident that he met Levi that day or Matthew that day. It was by plan and by purpose. Even though Levi, Matthew, didn't know about it, God knew about it because it's the same reason you're sitting here in this room today, same reason you're listening to online, is that God has chosen you. God has purposed in his heart to use your life for his greater kingdom good. And the way I love John 15, 15 illustrates this, it says this. He says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, he says, I call you friends. For everything that I've learned from my Father, I have made known to you. I love how Jesus took the time to put our relationship in a very precious context. The thing about friendship is you get to choose your friends, right? You can't choose your coworkers. You can't necessarily choose your neighbors. And I'd even say this, don't want to offend anybody, you can't choose your family, right? <laughs> but, but you can choose your friends. And when Jesus says, you are so precious to me that I've chosen you to be in my inner circle, that I want to share everything good that I have, I want to share my love, I want to share a relationship with you, and the idea that he says, I want you to be my friend, that you have a friend named Jesus that's in your life, because he sees you and he says, you're worthy of my time, I want to be at that table with you. And he goes on in verse 16, he says, you did not choose me, though you may think you did. The same reason somebody's in this room today and they're going to surrender their heart and their life to Jesus. You think you chose to visit this church, but God set it up for you to show up here today. It may be Google. It may be a friend. You may have had a good burger next door, but somehow you got it. City Point today, it's because God has chosen you. He says, I chose you and I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit that will last so that whatever you ask in my name, my father will give to you. He says, I've chosen you because I was made, you were made to bear fruit, that your life would, 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 it would make a difference in the world that you live in. And my, my concern is that the church, I think, is settled for busy rather than fruitful. We, we've settled for just having activity in our life, but not wondering, does this any, bear any eternal consequence? Does it do anything for the kingdom of God, or is it just keeping a system going? Is, 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 my, is my busyness just making the bank that holds my mortgage a little bit more money, or make the company that I work for a little bit more profitable? What am I doing that actually bears fruit? Have I settled for busy? And I remember a, a few days or weeks, I don't know, you know how time flies, but I was talking to somebody who was retired, and I said, well, how's retirement going? And they're like, man, I am busy. And I just started to laugh. I was like, well, when do you, when do you stop being busy in life? Like, even after you retired, he's like, well, I got to go visit my grandkids, and I'm doing this project in the lawn, and I got to play golf every two days a week. And I was just like, so many times we settle for busy and not for being fruitful. And I think busy is good. It's better than not having anything to do. But I want to make sure that we, as we are living in the design that God has for us, that within that busyness, part of that busyness is also being fruitful. And then he d- defines what that fruitfulness would look like. He says, this is my command. He says that you love each other. He says, if you're going to be busy bearing fruit for something, he goes, make sure that people around you feel loved, serve your community, reach the lost, do what I've called you to do, be Jesus wherever you are. And I I think without his leadership in our life, many of us would settle for busy, but God has chosen something so much better for us. He said, I want you to bear fruit that's eternal. So he's chosen us. He sees us. And the third leads me to my third point is he hears us. Now that we're his friends, we have his ear, we have a conversation, we have access to him to speak and and learn and to grow from him. And there's a story in the scriptures about a woman who's crying out to God, crying about something that was unseen by others, and and her name is Hannah, and she was crying out to God because she had prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for a child, but that child had never come. And once again, you see multiple wives in this scenario, which is once again why that's not good. And the one of the wives that had many children began to poke and prod on Hannah and make fun of her because she didn't have children. And, and so what we begin to see is a story. And as we, we look into the story, what I want you to understand is that as Hannah, we're going to watch her pray in just a moment, but your prayers matter to God. You sometimes wonder, well, does God really hear my prayers? He absolutely hears your prayers. 1 Peter 3 says this, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. 
There is a God who listens today. There is a God who cares. And I don't care if you've been praying about something for four years, five years, ten years. There are still things hidden in my heart that as a young man God spoke to me. And I haven't seen them yet, but I'm still praying for them today. I, I will not give up on those things because I feel like it's something God placed in my heart. And I think this is what we as believers have to discern. We have to discern between what is a good idea and what is a God idea for us. Because I'm convinced of this, there are things that God places in your heart that you can hang your hat on that you know. Now, it may be a step of faith. It may lead you out there to where you're praying and fasting and believing God. Maybe you have to even put more of your faith in him than ever before. But you have to discern the difference between is that a good idea or is that a God idea for me? But if it is a God idea, then you dig in deep and you pray and you believe and you fast. You do whatever you need to do until that shows up in your life because that's why God put it in your heart that you would not give up on it. And this is a story. So here's Hannah, verse 7 of 1 Samuel. It says, whenever Hannah went up to the house, Lord, her rival, that would be his, the other wife, provoked her till she wept and would not eat. And her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you just go eat? Why are you downhearted? I, I don't, I don't, don't I mean more than, to you than 10 sons? And what he's trying to do is to console her and say, listen, babe, even if we don't have kids, it's you and me. We, we love each other. That, that's enough. Be happy with that. And ultimately, Hannah had to make a decision because her husband was just trying to help her move on because he thought, man, this is not good. She's, she's fighting off depression. She's fighting off these things. Y'all know the burden of trying to believe God for something, and sometimes it's like you're pr pushing against a wall, and you don't know whether to give up or to keep praying, and that's the position that she was in. And so I think he was trying to alleviate her and just say, listen, let's go, let go of this. Let, let's move on. But Hannah could not move on. It goes on in Scripture, verse 12, as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. That's the priest at church or at the temple. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk, drunk at church. And he said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away that wine. <laughs> You're at church. Come on, right? She says, not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Hannah did not just pray this prayer once. Scripture gives the feeling that she prayed every day for this. That every day she would crumble before the Lord and say, How long, God? I've been praying. I've been seeking. I've been knocking. I've been doing what you've told me to do. How much longer do I have to wait? But I tell you, church, there's certain kind of prayers that are born out of that urgency of spirit that are born out of that desperation of soul, that touch the heart of God, but in the process of touching the heart of God, they shape you into who God's called you to be. There's something about that where all of a sudden you give up on everything else and you just lean in and you surrender to God. And the only reason you believe is because God and there's a beauty in that simplicity of faith that there's no other reason like Abraham and Sarah. There's no other reason like, like Peter getting out of the boat. There's no reason to think this will work except that he asked me to do it. And sometimes prayer, when you're praying and, and pushing into God, it's that same reason. There's no reason why this should work except God. There's no reason why I should be walking on water right now except that Jesus called me out of the boat. There's no reason we should have a baby. There's no reason the walls of Jericho should fall. There's no reason that Lazarus should come out of a grave except that he said it would. And there's something about that urgency of spirit that touches the heart of God. So in verse 20 it says, so in the course of time Hannah became pregnant. She gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel. She says, because I asked the Lord for him. She goes, you want to know how this baby got here? I prayed this baby into this world. I prayed this baby out of heaven right into my arms. And I believe there's things in our life that we pray in our lives, that we pray over the infertile places of our life and the infertile places of our soul, and we just say, God, you said there'd be life here, so I seek you for life. Pour out your strength. Pour out your wisdom. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Pour out your power. God, I need you. And just because it doesn't happen overnight, it's not a no. Just because it doesn't happen like everybody else, it's not a no. Sometimes there's something God does, and I don't fully understand God's ways, but I do know this, he's worth waiting on. I do know he finishes and fulfills his promises. So he sees us, he chose us, he hears us. The fourth thing, since he's chosen you and he hears you, now you have to know this, is that he speaks to us. God communicates to us. The very first thing I want you to understand is he speaks through his word. Every time you say, man, I need to hear the voice of God, well, first start with his word. God will never supersede his word. I don't care who says what to you and what they say God told them. If it is not in alignment with this word, 
don't listen to it. I don't even care how you feel and you think, man, I feel like I should do this. If it doesn't line to this word, throw it away. This is the foundation of your life. This is the North Star. This is the navigation. This is the compass of your soul. He speaks through his word first, and that's why I encourage you, get into his word on a daily basis. You'll be so surprised so many times where God just speaks to you a word and season in your life simply by opening up the pages of this Bible. 2 Timothy 3 says this, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching. It's useful for rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The second thing God does is he speaks through one another. He speaks through one another. It's why we value small groups. It's why we value relationship. It's why Jesus said, uh, though you're my disciples, but how you love one another. Why? Because God uses us to encourage one another. And it's not that that person has to say, well, the, thus says the Lord. But sometimes the Holy Spirit will inspire them just to say something to you. They don't even know they're being used by God, but it, but it just pricks your heart. And you know God just is working in me. I remember early in our church days, and, and there's a lot of obstacles when you start a church and financial and people resources. There's all, all everything is, is, is a problem at that point. And I remember talking to a good friend, and, and, and he just said, and I kind of, what came out of my mouth was basically I was lowering a standard. He said, you don't need to do that, Eddie. You need to believe God. If that's what God said, you need to do that. And it was a casual conversation, but it so stirred my heart. It made me go back to my house and just pray and say, God, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was doing that. Why? Because he uses one another to speak to us. So maybe if there's an encouraging word, maybe you're praying for a friend and God drops something in your heart, or, or maybe you're just trying to encourage somebody because we have a world that tears us down. God designed you and I to build each other up. It says this in First Thessalonians. He says, so encourage each other. He says, build each other up as you're already doing. We already have a world that tears us down. We have circumstances that tear us down. We have taxes that tear us down, right? But we build each other up. And then the last one, he speaks through his Holy Spirit. The very present helper in that time of trouble. The one who leads us and guides us. Hebrews 3, 7 says this, today if you hear his voice. And there's something about leaning into the voice of God in your life and being sensitive to that voice. In fact, I encourage people never make a decision, a big decision, little decision, without first getting alone and saying, Holy Spirit, what do you want to do? I'm asking that question all the time in my life. What's the best way to do this? Even if I have a practical idea how to do it, I always lean into him because he knows. He knows the unseen part of Eddie Woods. He knows the doors that will open in a year that I can't see that are open today. All we can see is our past, and if we're lucky, maybe one or two days in our future. But that's it. But he sees around the corner. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will tell us things to come. And so we lean into that voice in our life, but to be a good steward of his voice in our life, what we have to understand, he works with his word, works with one another, he works with the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, you've got to make some decisions that help fine-tune your hearing. Number one, you need to obey the voice of the Holy Spirit. If he comes and he says something to you, don't doubt it, don't question it, obey it. Number two, when the Holy Spirit begins to speak to you, don't ignore his voice and don't assume that he'll keep speaking to you about an area if you're not obeying what he's already saying. Don't take for granted the leadership of the Holy Spirit, but, but cherish his leadership in your life and say, you know what? I'm hearing what you're saying. I'm going to walk into that. And the next thing you need to know about hearing God's voice is he may be silent to you about something he's already spoken to you about. What do I mean by that? Is let's say God gave you a direction or gave you a promise a few years ago and you keep praying about it, wanting to hear more, but he's already told you everything he's going to tell you. Just go, do, right? Start, start the church, Eddie. Well, is everything going to be okay? Yeah, I told you, start. And so sometimes in our life, the way we procrastinate and the way that we feed doubt in our life is we keep asking about God something about he already answered for us. And we need to allow his answer to be an answer and run with that word in our life. And then the last thing I would say this is you don't have to pray about what's already written in his word. Every once in a while hear a believer like, well, I know the scripture says to do this, but I'm praying about doing it. I'm like, God's not crazy like the world we live in. He doesn't change his mind. If he said yes to that 2,000 years ago, if you ask him today, it's still yes. It's kind of, as a parent, you've learned that sc skill of being resolute with your kids. Like, if you say no, it's just no. And I used to tell my kids, the more you make me say no, the longer that no lasts. So if you want ice cream today and I say no, that's today. You ask again, that's tomorrow. You ask again, that's next month. <laughs> you ask again, happy graduation, son. You know, like that's just, that's where it goes. When he speaks it in Scripture... It's an expectation of immediate obedience in our life. And then the last thing I would say this is not only does he see us, not only does he choose us, not only does he hear us, not only does he speak to us, but he saves us. 
And I think so many times in our life, we take for granted the salvation, how wealthy that salvation is. We take for granted that we're gathered in this room today and we're worshiping Jesus today and we have the word of God and we have the, his presence in our life. We take for granted the miracles that happen in the altar. We take for granted the relationship and the community because though it is free to us, it was very expensive to the son of God. The reason we can enjoy the benefits of our salvation and the freedom and the joy and all the things that we have is because somebody stepped up a little over 2,000 years ago and said, I'm going to pay the tab for all of mankind to experience God's best at my own personal sacrifice so that they can have joy in the darkest times, so that they can have hope when they feel hopeless, when everybody says they should give up. I want to give them the ability to stand in faith because I want to show them that I am for them, that I will restore them, that I love them more than they love themselves. Jesus was led to the cross. He was put on trial, railroaded, then thrown to the Roman centurions who were the elite soldiers of that day. The Roman soldiers stripped him of his clothes, put a robe on his shoulders, fashioned a crown of thorns, shove onto his head and then beat that crown of thorns on with a staff. And then they bowed before him, these warriors, and mocked Jesus. After they had their fun, they picked him up and they whipped him, the cat of nine tails, till his back was laid open. That was enough abuse for any man. But then after that, they grabbed a heavy wooden cross. They put it on his shoulders and they made him carry his cross to his own crucifixion, to his own torture, to his own death. They put our Messiah on a hill called Golgotha. They laid him down on a wooden cross took nine inch nails, pierced his skin and nailed a man to a piece of wood. They did the same with his feet. Jesus hung there, bleeding and crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's easy for us now, 2000 years later to be like, that's so cruel, I cannot believe they did that to him. But they were simply doing what we have done. It was our sin that put that crown of thorns on his head. It was our sin that tore open his back it was our sin that drove those nails into the cross. And as I read that and I think about that, it's an incredible salvation that we have. And listen to what Jesus said in the face of that persecution, in the face of that physical abuse. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. There's a salvation because he sees us, because he hears us. Because he's chosen us he saves us and it's such a rich salvation church we often forget how rich it is and we move past it so quickly but it was not easy for him he made it easy for us he was a sacrifice in Genesis 3 when sin enters the world the Son of God made a plan with the Father and the Holy Spirit of how they would redeem mankind he said that one day his heel would crush the serpent's head he would defeat death hell and the grave and sin that's why Romans 5 says this, you see that just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 10, for while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Church, you've been given life. Not the kind of life we can give one another, but a life that is supernatural in its context and that is eternal, that takes death and laughs at it and mocks it. A life that tells us the worst part of our existence is probably here on this planet because there's a place of glory rating for us where God rewards us and we live in his presence where there's no more tears and no more pain. There is a life that God has saved us from. That's why I think today as we celebrate baptism, it's such an incredible thing to celebrate because what we're about to see in this tank is not something that was given cheaply. It costs heaven everything. It cost Jesus the very breath in his body. He had to die to rise from the dead so that you and I can leave our old man in this tank. And we can say, who I used to be, God, I am no more. I'm a new person in Christ Jesus. These old things have passed away, and behold, all things have come new. This is not a tradition of the church. This is a worship service to the incredible saving power of Jesus Christ and the resurrection and the redemption of the human soul. That's why in Acts 22 it says this, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. Today is a beautiful day because there's a God who knows us. 
beyond how any human being could ever know you. Let's all stand and I want to pray. Just right where you're at, if you don't mind, just shut your eyes. The presence of God is here. God loves you. What hurts you hurts him. That battle that you're fighting so quietly in your soul, not wanting to bleed on anybody around you, he sees. You don't have to be strong on your own anymore. He wants to be your strength. He's safe to trust. Father, right now, we we thank you for your presence that's here. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray for every person that's here, whether listening online or in person. That Father, if you're working in their life, if Holy Spirit, you're applying this word. God, we pray that you'd be poured out, that your power would be let loose. God, for some, it's setting them free from a perspective of themselves that is so untrue. It's not the way you created them to be. I pray, Father, for liberty, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Father, I thank you that you see us, that you've chosen us, God, that you hear us, that you speak to us, God, that you've saved us. And I pray that, Father, we would live in the fullness of that today, live in the power of that today. And Father, what an incredible life that has been given to us through the cost of your own sons. We give you the glory and honor right now in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here today and in this room, you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity. I want you to know that heaven can be your home, that he can be your savior, that your sins can be forgiven. There's a decision that you have to make to allow him to be the Lord of your life and put your faith in him. Romans 10 says this, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So we're all going to pray a prayer together in this church. We want to support you and as you, as you turn your life over to Jesus. But if you're here in this room and you say, Pastor, that prayer is for me today. I want to surrender my heart and my life to Jesus. If that's you, can you raise your hand so I can see the palm of your hand this morning, this afternoon, so I can see who I'm praying with today. Amen. Amen. Others, you say, that's me. That's awesome. Let's all say this prayer together. Everybody say it after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I ask that you forgive me of my sins. I should be the Lord of my life. And I choose to follow you with all of my heart from this day forward. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God praise for those who prayed that prayer. Now, what, what you did was a beautiful decision what, that you just made. Just a moment, baptism is a declaration. It's letting the world know, hey, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on team Jesus now. I'm forgiven. I'm made new. But there's a couple of things I want to share with you before we move on. And number one, for those who prayed that prayer a minute from the bottom of your heart, get involved in church. I don't mean just show up every once in a while. I mean, put some roots down in this place. Go to Connection Point. Get involved. Join the church. Let, let this become your spiritual family. Because you just started something. You didn't end thing. Yes, the old man is ended. That, that sin, that's forgiven. But God has given you a fresh start. So let us help you run your race in a way that gives God glory. Number two, I want to encourage you to get water baptized. If, you, if you, We'd love for you to be baptized today. It'll come around in probably another, I think, four or six weeks. Uh, uh, but if not, I'll, we'd love for you to do it today. We're ready for you. And then the third, te- third thing, in just a moment, our prayer team's going to be down here to pray for whatever. We got some prayer warriors. There's miracles that take place in this altar, breakthroughs that take place in this altar. And so I want you to come and just for a couple minutes, let them pray with you. So let them welcome you into the family of God and say, hey, I prayed the prayer with that pastor. And, and just let God seal what he began in you today. Let something new take place. Before we do that, we're going to worship God and our giving. Uh, for those who want to give cash or checks, there's envelopes in the back of your seat. As you're preparing your giving, uh, I wanted to share a scripture with you out of Malachi 3. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. It says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I'll not throw open the floodgates of heaven. Pour out such blessing will not be room enough to receive it. Before the ushers pass the buckets, uh, for those who are getting baptized, you are dismissed. You can leave real quick uh, as they're about to pass the buckets. Uh, as the ushers pass the buckets now, y'all can go ahead and begin to pass them. Um, I want to remind those who want to give by card today that there's a QR code over my shoulder. You can scan that. That same connection card that's in the back of your seat, you can scan that. It'll take you to our giving platform. But it is a joy to trust God with our finances. Worship, Scripture says. We're not giving God anything. We're worshiping God with what he's given us is what giving is. So as we do that today, I want to pray over that. And as I pray, our prayer team's going to be down here. 
I don't care if you have a big need, a small need, there is power and agreement. And you say, I don't know about that. There, that's what scripture says. And so sometimes you have to disobey your emotions to obey the word of God. You have to say no to the, your thinking to say yes to God's thinking. And so maybe today you're like a Hannah and you just need somebody to agree with you for a miracle. You may have been knocking on this door 10 years, but what you never know that one more time what God will do. And so our prayer team's going to be down here. We're going to worship and pray, and then we're going to baptize everybody. But let me pray over our offering as our prayer team comes up, the worship team. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for this opportunity to worship you with what you blessed us with. God, I thank you that you are God and more than enough. And I pray that, Father, what is in the hands of every person here, Father, as we honor you with it, God, that you bless what remains in our hands. Father, I pray that you're blessed in this church, that, God, we'll all have more than enough to give to every good cause and be who you've called us to be in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's worship. My list. All right. Looks like first up today. Are we starting? Okay, we're starting with. I don't really know how this is supposed to go. So if I do it wrong, I'm sorry. We're starting with Lynn. Check. With yeah. Lynn. Roar. There we go. Hey everyone. Um, my name is Cesar Lopez. I'm the next gen pastor here at Haven. Um, we've had some youth give their life to Christ, and so we're going to start off uh, baptism by baptizing some youth. So can we praise God for that? Come on, can you give it up? Ready? Okay, so, Lynn, before I baptize you, I'm going to ask you, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Okay, now cover your nose. I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Next, we have Jade Jones. Jade, come on, girl. Woohoo! Jade, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Okay. I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have Chloe Hine. Chloe. Oh, Hina. Chloe Hina. Sorry. taking place and so y'all need to pray for our youth ministry pray for uh pastor caesar and jenny and just what god wants to do because i'm telling you there's a move of god coming through the young people of our nation i really believe it and uh i'm praying god put us on the front line of whatever you're doing amen. we're in whatever it is amen so let's amen. baptize some more all right so now colin come on up colin yates Now this young man, his his mom was in our youth ministry with Ann, and she met a wonderful man named Jeremy, and, uh, and together they've had Colin. Here, brother, cross your arms. Father, I thank you for Colin and his decision to follow you. And I baptize him now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Woo! Yes. <laughs> Woo, way to go, Colin. All right, next up we have Mariah Rangel. Mariah. All right, Mariah. Next step. Another step. There you go. All right. You can turn the face this way. Uh, cross your arms. Father, I thank you for Mariah and her decision to follow you, and I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.
All right, next we have Eric Gomez. Eric! Father, I thank you for Eric and his decision to follow you. And I baptize him now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And next we have Josh Canfield. Josh. Father, I thank you for Josh and his decision to follow you. And I baptize him now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So awesome. I'm going to jump here to Gunnar Rutherford. Gunnar, come on down. Woo! Gunnar. Sunday. 